Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, lecture and uh, we are looking at uh, currently the, the deformation uh, microstructure details of uh, the single crystal subjected to strain controlled critique or low cycle critique. Okay. So, in the last class we were uh, uh, discussing about the cyclic saturation in the single crystals and uh, I'll just go through review this quickly and then we will take this discussion forward. So in single crystal uh, which are subjected to cyclic uh, uh, deformation under strain controlled mode results in the hysteresis loop corresponds to the a state where the equilibrium is achieved between bundles of uh, edge dislocation and surrounding matrix piled by screw dislocation. This is one hypothesis. Under these conditions, uh, fine slip markings are observed on the free surfaces. This slip concentration process is uh, nucleated at the beginning of region B in the cyclic st st strain curve and it is intensified as the applied strain is increased. See, what you have to now appreciate is we are now talking about the three stages of a cyclic stress strain curve like A, B, C, like we have divided uh, this stress strain curve. We have discussed in the last lecture how to generate this uh, cyclic stress strain curve. It is the, you know, the peak tensile stress of all the hysteresis loops are connected from the first cycle to the saturation cycle. So then it is uh, and then it is uh, analyzed as a, a shear stress versus shear strain curve under the cyclic deformation. So now we are looking at now the region, beginning of the region of this the cyclic stress strain curve and what are the microstructural aspects which is accompanying that deformation. That is how we should look at it. So earlier investigation uh, showed that fatigue crack initiated along these bands where the slip was intense and these slip lines are termed persistent uh, slip bands like uh, we have seen yesterday. It's uh, popularly called as uh, PSBs which is proposed by Thompson, Wordsworth and Lowert in 1956 who found these uh, PSBs in copper and uh, nickel and the name is because it is uh, the slip is a through thickness slip of uh, material. So that is why it is called a persistent slip band. So you can see this is a typical fatigued microstructure uh, obtained in a copper single crystal in the plastic strain of 10 to minus 3 at room temperature. And what you are the purpose of this slide is to give you a, a glimpse of you know signature uh, microstructure or feature, typical feature which you see only under fatigue. You don't see it under any other deformation condition. So what you see, this is a PSBs and this is a matrix where you have uh, bundles of dislocations are uh, there and uh, so you can see the later structure of a PSB and the PSB walls matrix veins are you know irregular and uh, you know entangled and PSB walls and screw dislocations in the channels between the walls so you will have all the uh, screw dislocations channels in the inside the I mean along the wall or inside the wall and so on so but you don't have to worry about this uh, details but what you should appreciate in this slide is what is the primary signature of this fatigue microstructure that is what my intention the dislocation found with within PSBs is considerably different from that of matrix the matrix contain, contains about 50 percent by volume vein like structures consisting of dense arrays of edge dislocations. On the other hand, PSB structure is generated due to mutual blocking of glide dislocations and the formation of parallel, that's a later structure, which occupy 10% by volume of PSBs, which is reported by these authors. Yeah, this is where we uh, stopped yesterday. And the typical uh, microstructure which forms after the, you know, the sequence of microstructural changes at a higher plastic strain. So we are now looking at uh, 
stage, I mean, region B, and then we are going to region C now. This is uh, typically for an FCC semi-crystals. And formation of labyrinth and cell structure. So labyrinth is nothing but because of its uh, arrangements. You can see that it is almost appearing like a labyrinth structure. And then you also see some cell structure. So you can see the cell structure here. So this is a, a signature of the microstructural evolution at the higher plastic strain during fatigue. Matrix phase with labyrinth structure, PSBs and labyrinth structure, finally cell structure. So these are the signatures, uh, microstructural features for the higher plastic strain amplitude region. Secondary slip prevalent in the uh, region C because it is a high strain rate, right? I mean high strain, uh, high plastic strain. Secondary slip originates at the PSB matrix interface and spreads in the form of expanding cell structure which fills the PSB. So these are all some of the key observations. The transformation of all PSBs into cell structure appears to take place after 10 to the power 6 cycles. This marks the beginning of secondary hardening in the region C. So you can see that the, the stress strain curve goes up, little bit up, right, like uh, the third stage. So that is considered as a secondary hardening. So that happens after the all the PSBs dissolves uh, into uh, cell structures, right. So that is one uh, way of understanding how the, the dislocation substructure you can witness at least. So now we'll, let us discuss about the effect of crystal structure dislocation structure, uh, uh, effect of crystal structure dislocation and structures in a BCC crystal. Okay, crystal structure and dislocation structures in BCC. At low strain amplitude, cyclic deformation is manifestation of motion of edge dislocation only. At high strain amplitudes, large scale motion of edge and screw dislocation and culminates in the formation of cell structure. So this is in contrast to what we have seen in an FCC crystal, that is what uh, we have to see. Although no PSBs have been identified in either region of plastic strain amplitudes in BCC crystal, ill-defined bands of slip which could lead to crack nucleation have been noticed. So what you have to appreciate here is the, the microstructure develops or the dislocation substructure develops in this BCC is quite different from the FCC. That is the bottom line you have to keep in mind. Other details are, uh, I mean, you can you can just learn as the as you go to the higher learning, but the basic difference you have to just appreciate. The following difference between BCC and FCC crystal uh, point to some causes of distinction, disti I mean, distinctions in their fatigue response. At 295 Kelvin and at low plastic strain amplitudes, thermally activated glide of two dislocations as well as dislocation multiplications are strongly suppresses in BCC iron. Whereas in FCC metals are only weakly strain rate sensitive, the flow stress of BCC metals is strongly dependent upon the strain rate. So all these aspects we know already. See that is why we, uh, you know, we study all the basics of you know deformations in the beginning itself. Now you can just Take what is the changes that happens because of the fatigue loading. That is the point we have to see. For example, PSB, which we have never seen, that is coming just only because of the fatigue. But other things we have already known from the basic dislocation mechanisms during the formation, the strain rate effect, temperature effect, all these things we know. So we can just correlate all of them together. We don't have to, I mean, we can just move uh, forward. Now, the, the important point is to uh, appreciate the Mono, the difference between monotonic and cyclic deformation. The primary difference in the microstructure in the density of dislocations produced during cyclic loading is significantly higher than the generated during the monotonic function. So this is very, uh, very important and it's clearly evident. Yesterday we have seen that you know the, the stress strain curve of you know uh, basically a shear stress versus shear strain plots of monotonic versus cyclic. We have seen that in a cyclic deformation, the the plot exhibits the you know, significant accommodation of plastic strain during cyclic load as compared to monotonic load. So that clearly shows that the that also will clearly uh, relate that the kind of microstructures which is going to develop during the 
cyclic grooming, right? So that is what we are seeing now. During monotonic tensile deformation in a single crystal, both the slip plane and the slip direction rotate towards the tensile axis. However, there is no such orientation change during fully reversed cyclic loading. PSB is the only characteristic of cyclic deformation. A striking feature of fatigue deformation is the establishment of saturated state. So this is another uh, characteristic point we have to, uh, I mean characteristic features you have to remember as far as the cyclic deformation is concerned. So all the hysteresis loop reaches the cyclic, I mean saturated st uh, state. That's why we, 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 even, we even write that sigma S, right? Sigma stress correspond to the saturation. That is called saturation stress, but here we are talking about saturation state of the microstructure where the peak resolved shear stress is independent of plastic shear strain amplitude. One of the most visible distinct, uh, distinctions between monotonic and cyclic deformation is the development of surface roughness in plastically deformed crystals. So, what in a monotonic deformation we we develop a slip, a steps you can see because of the slip, okay. But in cyclic deformation, it is going to be very different. So, so this is what it is. In a cyclic uh, uh, deformation, we we have a characteristic uh, feature, intrusions and extrusions. These are surface markings we can clearly identify in the fracture surface. Most of the fatigue loading, uh, I mean fatigued sample, we we call it. You can see that you know. Uh, uh, extrusions and intrusions and they are all happen they all happen at the bundles with the, some you know it is not going to happen uniformly in the matrix you have some undeformed matrix also in between but this uh, you know the pile of, of crystals which comes out as an extruded uh, member and then also an in intruded member on the other hand in a slip thing, which is like a the crystals just deforms like a steps. This is a primary difference between one of the primary differences between these uh, two deformations. So now we just uh, extend these ideas like whatever we have seen in the uh, deformation, the single crystal, uh, and then we'll try to relate to the polycrystal. Okay. As a general thumb, I mean general rule of thumb. Well annealed polycrystalline metals of high purity exhibit cyclic hardening due to dislocation multiplication as evidenced by an increase in the stress amplitude with fatigue cycles. So in a pure polycrystalline material, the uh, especially uh, you know a copper kind of uh, material, uh, in an annealed state it, it exhibits completely cyclic hardening. So that is because of the work hardening. See, we have for hardening in a monotonic uh, deformation. Here it is cyclic hardening. And work hardened material undergoes strain softening under cyclic loading. This is also true in even in monotonic uh, loading, right? So the work hardened material eventually softens. Here also the work cyclically hardened material eventually softens as the number of cycles increases. And what are the reasons? The, re the rearrangement of pre-strained induced dislocation networks due to the fatigue is believed to cause cyclic softening. So here we talk about recovery, here also similar effects. So all the dislocation rearrangement takes place, which leads to cyclic softening. So how do you uh, observe whether the, the material is being you know, subjected to cyclic hardening and softening? Just by looking at the uh, stress strain response uh, while the testing is going on you will get this data so we have this you know this is a strain controlled uh, test so you have a strain versus time so you can suppose if you are using this kind of a waveform for the test and in a cyclic hardening what you observe is uh, see you have the you are controlling the strain and then observe what is the stress response. So that is how you should look at it. So as the number of uh, cycle increases, then you can see that there is a stress increase. The peak tensile stress increases. Okay. In terms of hysteresis loop, you can see that it starts from 1 and it goes through 2, 3 and 4 and 5. So it reaches, so it, you can keep on the 
the edge of this uh, hysteresis loop is keep on increasing 1 3 5 and so on okay so this is hardening and also you see that in the uh, strain axis the hysteresis loop becomes thinner and thinner as it moves up okay so that is one thing and cyclic softening it is entirely opposite what you are observing there so uh, the the stress is coming down with respect to time and uh, the strain is keep on increasing so that means the hysteresis loop become bulkier and bulkier as the uh, as the cycle number of cycle increases the strain also increases so please remember this is a plastic strain we are talking about because uh, this is a strain control all the strain controlled fatigue we are talking about plastic strain so that is uh, yeah similar uh, plot and uh, just give the comparison of these two uh, strain stress controlled loading you observe the strain response and uh, if it is a cyclic hardening and uh, strain will keep on reducing with respect to time and the strain response for cyclic softening that it will keep on increasing here like we have just seen in the previous slide for a strain controlled loading a stress stress response for the cyclic hardening will be like this and stress response for the cyclic softening will be like this so it is exactly this this kind of behavior you can see that but here it is strain but here it is stress here is a strain and here is a stress so it's quite interesting to compare uh, all of them together like this to appreciate what are the what are the associated transient effects in pity okay so just this, this plot is just uh, give you an idea about what are the you know parameters how they are uh, designated for example since it is a range of uh, strain we are talking about it is always designated as delta epsilon and then this is delta sigma so in cyclic loading the stress is in between the range right so it is always designated as delta sigma so and the hysteresis loop is uh, shown here and this is a plastic strain and this is an elastic strain range and plastic strain range and uh, so this is a typical um, stress strain i mean hysteresis loop and uh, if you if you connect all the corners of the edges of the loop and then this this represents the cyclic stress strain term. so in in the in the previous uh, uh, i mean previous lecture we were talking about only this portion of this so it was showing also a third stage so this is a second stage this is a first stage a b c like that we have seen in the uh, and then we also discussed the microstructural changes associated with this right and uh, this particular uh, schematic shows the the procedures for obtaining the cyclic uh, stress strain curve so how do we where do you stop and how do you generate cyclic stress strain curve suppose if you are taking the the constant uh, strain test then you choose particular uh, strain amplitude and then waveform and then keep on cycling uh, as a function of time till the saturation reaches so once the saturation is reached then you can take the data from like this so the final loop has to uh, be saturated then you can take the uh, stress strain curve data I and mean, just cyclic stress strain data and this is for the constant strain plastic strain uh, amplitude and if it is not uh, constant it is if it is a multiple step then what you have to do is uh, you you just cycle the material at a different strain amplitudes okay with the increasing plastic strain amplitude after the saturation at each stage so for example this a small a lower strain amplitude so it has to reach a saturation then you start increasing the amplitude and then it will again start you know a new hysteresis loop and then it has to saturate so at every stage or every uh, type of the strain or a waveform you choose we need to wait for the saturation to come that is the idea then it is ready to collect the stress strain data so similarly for an incremental step uh, 
repeated patterns consisting of uh, you know, linearly increasing and decreasing strain limits. So this is increasing and decreasing, increasing and decreasing. So you, you just do this till you reach the saturation. So that is a uh, one way of uh, looking at how to generate the cyclic stress strain curve. Now we will uh, turn our attention to uh, one important point, a very fundamental idea, uh, Washinger's effect. Washinger effect. Okay. So we all know that uh, uh, a true stress, true strain curve, and uh, this is a, uh, I mean, the curve which is not, it's a continuous yielding without any sharp yield point. point. So assume this is a sigma naught, a proof stress. And suppose after reaching this point, uh, uh, if you just uh, unload, then immediately you, you will be able to recover some elastic energy or elastic strain, right? So from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, this is immediate. But after some time, also some of the materials will try to relax uh, some more elastic strain. So that is an elasticity. That also we understand, right? On the other hand, if you just cross a a plastic uh, region here and then unload it, it is not going to come back on this because you are in the plastic range and you are going to unload here and then you reach here and then suddenly start loading, then they, the stress strain will start from here. Okay. So this is, uh, we know, this also we have discussed during, you know, um, tensile monotonic deformation, we have discussed all this behavior. But what we have not discussed so far is, suppose if you come down in compression immediately, then what happens? We have discussed in the elastic region, in the elastic properties, in the anelastic behavior we have discussed. But in a plastic region, we have not discussed closely. <coughs> so, excuse me. So, what happens? Uh, you, are, you are crossing this uh, sigma naught and reaching this uh, plastic uh, region and then unload it. So you have some elastic recovery will take place, but then eventually you are changing the load direction. Then what happens? So that's the that is the question now. So the what you have to observe here is interestingly, suppose if your sigma naught is a yield point in the in this direction, when the material is subjected to the tensile loading, when it uh, when the load is reversed in the compression direction and now the material will yield at much lower strength level as compared to in a tension mode. So that is the idea. So that is why the, this is considered to be or this is uh, uh, referred to as uh, due to Washington effect. So that is why sigma b. Okay. So now we will see in detail why it happens. Uh, we will replot this and then it is, uh, you know, it is reconstructed in this form. It is a compression only, but it is just for the reference, it is being uh, reconstructed. So don't get confused with that. So you have this, uh, the delta sigma b, the, the difference in the, you know, uh, stress in the reverse loading is given as delta sigma b. So this is delta epsilon b. This is a strain and this is the stress. So this is uh, Washinger effect is related to changes in the dislocation substructures induced by reverse loading and in ensuing changes in the internal stress systems. It is a general comment we are talking about. General comment, it is related to a dislocation substructure changes See, you know that you know in tensile deformation, particular you know type of uh, deformation substructures, uh, dislocation substructures evolve. We, in fact, we can uh, we have uh, is immediately we have just uh, referred this to even you know, work hardening behavior and you know, cell structure formation, um, you know, cell wall formation and so on. But when it when it happens when it get re reversed, then what happens to all this uh, dislocation substructures? That is something related to this. 
In polycrystalline metals, dislocation walls and sub-boundaries form during forward straining. The dissolution of so the cell walls and sub-boundaries upon stress reversals is considered contributing to washing the effect. So it's basically whatever the substructures evolve, it get dissolves a little bit. So that is one of the you know causes uh, people have hypothesized. Okay, this is one idea. A knowledge of the mechanisms underlying the washing air effect is essential for fundamental understanding of what hardening phenomena and rationalizing fatigue effects as mean stress relaxation and creep, cyclic creep. So this effect, washing air effect is quite important to understand because even in monotonic work hardening phenomena, we have to understand because the, it reverses some of the dislocation substructures and we can rationalize the fatigue effects because fatigue is cyclic loading and also cyclic creep, okay, which is important. For example, many commercial aluminum alloys containing non-shearable strengthening precipitates such as peak aged or over aged 7075 alloys used in air traps are stretched prior to temper treatments to relieve thermal residual stresses. Okay, this is about, you know, the we, 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 have, we have talked in fracture mechanics of proof stress, right? So this is not that uh, proof testing in a shop floor where to generate a plastic zone at the crack tip, right? But here we are talking about no fracture or no crack, but just as a component we, which is assumed to be uh, defect free is subjected to uh, stretching, okay, in order to uh, relieve the thermal residual stresses. So that also uh, will take care of this uh, kind of washing air effect. At very low flow stresses may result and for service conditions if the material is loaded in an opposite to stretching direction. So this has to be uh, monitored because uh, this treat stretching this treatment is done for the relieving the residual stresses. But then we have to take care which is not you know loaded in the opposite direction. Of the stretching. That is where the significance of Boschinger effect comes. On a more fundamental level, the Boschinger effect can be used to identify the contributions to strain hardening from a different kind of dislocation mechanisms. This is also one uh, important aspect of a Boschinger effect. Okay. So now we will, uh, anyway, Boschinger effect is related to fatigue, that's why I brought it to this section. And uh, we will now look at what are the other aspects of uh, you know cyclic loading. Uh, one of the important uh, aspects is effects of precipitation. Cyclic hardening and softening in precipitation hardened alloys is promoted by a mechanisms in which the precipitate geometry and distribution as well as the dislocation particle interaction can be altered by cyclic strain. So we have the background of understanding uh, the precipitate dislocation interactions, right? So this, how this interaction is now getting affected by the cyclic straining is a, another question, right? There's a new effect like the PSB formation we have discussed about a dislocation substructure, even though we know uh, some idea about uh, dislocation substructure in uh, monotonic loading. Similarly, we, we have some idea about dislocation particle interaction. In addition to that, what is the cyclic uh, straining effect on that particular interaction is the question. Experimental evidence shows that the initial cyclic hardening occurs in these materials due to an increase in dislocation density and due to dislocation precipitate interactions. So it, it contributes to cyclic hardening little bit to start with. Subsequently, cyclic softening is highly favored if the precipitates in the age hardened alloy are easily sheared by dislocations. So very important point that is if they are fine, closely spaced and coherent with the matrix. So this particular sentence, you know, we, we can completely understand. We have a sufficient background to understand every word of it because we, we, we have seen how dislocation, when the dislocation will shear the particle and how they are related to the size of the particle and spacing between the particle and whether it is coherent or incoherent. All the aspects we know. So, the once the cyclic straining is going to destroy all this and uh, 
I mean, the, the strain hardening mechanisms, they are all going to get uh, promote or they are going to contribute to the softening activity. Various mechanisms are proposed. Reversion or resolution by which the metastable strengthening precipitates completely dissolve in the matrix after being cut by the dislocation to a size smaller than the critical size of the particle nucleation. So once the dislocation keep on cutting the particles, which is small enough to dissolve back in the matrix, then also this uh, cyclic softening will get promoted. Disordering of ordered precipitate due to motion of the single dislocations to them. So this also we know when the, as long as the, the dislocation uh, cuts through the ordered precipitate in a single uh, entity, then it, the order is uh, destroyed. Okay. If it comes as a pair, that's a different question. That also we have seen. If it comes as a pair, then one will destroy the order, other will restore. Right. That also we have seen. So this is one typical uh, micrograph. Uh, a dark field TEM, micrograph of VASP alloy, fatigued at plastic strain of 10 to the power 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 at 650 degrees centigrade. Shading of gamma prime Ni3L precipitate is nicely shown here. So, I hope you can see that, which is uh, reported in this uh, uh, reference. Uh, in fact, most of the texts are from this reference only. Microstructural inhomogeneities in the form of slip bands that are really depleted of uh, precipitates. These are all the, some of the features which are uh, contributing to cyclic softening. That's what I'm just listed here. Overaging, which leads to the substitution of metastable precipitates in the matrix by coarsely distributed stable ones. Dissolution due to Oswald ripening of unsheared precipitates, adjacent to the sheared ones on the slip planes at the expense of smaller precipitates in the slip band. So all these uh, microstructural parameters, they are going to promote cyclic softening. 